worry about overusing something. They they just plop it into the scene and and let it do its thing. Um, so it's. Uh, I think. C- C- yeah, C- CG. Uh, well, when I first started using it, let's say twenty years ago, um, they overused it. You know, mm-hmm. instead of having three hundred Indians on the mountain going after the cavalry, they had three hundred thousand. You know. Yeah. And and now I think they're getting a little bit better about it by restricting it. You know. For but sure. uh, it it did change the whole mm-hmm. complexion of uh, movie making. So so exactly how was the shark controlled? Oh well, electronically uh, it, it was. Uh, you had uh, big rams that would open and close the mouth, mm-hmm. and uh, so then you had all this electronic uh, gear inside the shark. So then there were all cables over to a, a barge uh, where the the, the shark, uh, the, the special effects guys would handle it, and they could open and close the mouth. Yeah. Uh, when it was being towed, they towed it from another boat, and they could control the, uh, the way the... Uh, it was interesting because I did some tests mm-hmm. with the shark swimming, yeah. okay. and I was uh, looking at that with our editor, uh, uh Verna Fields, who won the Academy Award for editing Jaws, and they had Ron and Valerie Taylor, who had uh, from uh, Australia, who shot some footage for us of real sharks. Uh, and uh, I was talking to Valerie, and she looked at our test. And she said, "Joe, you don't have to move the shark as much as you're moving it. They swim, you know. They just sort of swagger in, or then they attack." So it, w- it really helped because that way I didn't have to wag the tail so much because a big white dark shark doesn't do that. It's just sort of floats up on you, you know, and then mm-hmm. moves, you know. That's amazing. So uh, the other question I have, of course, and I think a lot of people want to know this, is is does Jaws still exist? Is he still around? Like is the actual model or the... the yeah, the let me tell you about that. Uh, what happened was this. Uh, when we got back from the studio, from this location, mm-hmm. we were over budget, over schedule. And uh, I ended up, Stephen left early, I, I ended up directing a sequence, a small sequence he asked me, me to do with the shark, taking the kid off the raft. When we got back, we were not heroes. We, They were so upset with us, over budget, over schedule, this dumb shark movie is not going to do anything. And they threw the sharks in the back lot and let them rot. Oh, no. Okay. And then they sold the boat. They sold the orca, which was uh, something we had built. We built two of them, one to sink and to have, give it real character. Mm-hmm. So they just threw it jaws. Well, then the movie came out. And uh, they didn't have anything for the tours. <laughs> so they took the original mold and they made a big fiberglass shark and they hung it up uh by its tail, and people took pictures in front of it, and that they did that for a, a number of years until they made the shark ride uh, for the, uh, you know, uh, for the Universal Tour thing. Yeah. Okay. Then that that particular shark disappeared, and it ended up in this big. Uh, it's not a. It's a car lot, but it, they sell. They have used cars, but you, it's for parts. You go there and you could buy fenders and stuff from if your car is there and stuff like that. But anyway, okay. the guy put it up on a pole, and it was there for years. And then I got a call from uh, this guy, Corey Turner, from NPR in New York, and he flew out and he said, I want to see this thing. So you know, I did a, a picture with him in front of the shark, and we talked about it. And so that's really the physical shark. Well, it was deteriorating. It looked terrible. They put phony wooden teeth on it. A couple of years later, I got a call from somebody uh, from the uh, uh, Motion Picture Museum, and they wanted to you know, buy it and use it. I said, okay, but it needs tremendous repair. So a good friend of mine, uh, Greg Nicotero, who does The Walking Dead, he directs them, and, but he has a company that builds all these prosthetics, Mm-hmm. And and he's been a big Jaws fan. We've been friends for years. So his company took it and restored it. And um, anyway, it's restored, and it's going to go into the museum once they got a place for the museum. 
And uh, incidentally, I'm not pushing my book, but in my new book, uh, there is that shows that shark being redone for the museum. So mm-hmm. it, it's physically the same shark, uh, but it's not the one with all the mechanics because that one didn't exist. Uh, we had to rebuild it for Jaws two. Uh, we rebuilt them for Jaws 2, oh, wow. and then they sort of di- disappeared for that. And then Jaws 3, I made one that was uh, 10 feet bigger, a 35-foot shark, or half of it, uh, because it has to it has somebody in it, so it had to be bigger. Yes. But that's sort of the uh, the shark stories, you know, of where it is and what's happened to it. Yeah, that's amazing. So, like, it's so funny that, that that's what kind of how things went down and everybody was you know, mad with you for being things over budget and, and who would have known that it would have done so well? Um, because I mean, back then it, it, it was a, it was a record setter for, for in the box. Well, office, right. And then... yeah, let me tell you uh, what happened. Anthony. Uh, when we did the shark, you know, you, you, how it worked, it had all these valves and stuff. So when we were shooting it, it, it made all these weird sounds. <laughs> and then, after the take, Stephen would say, cut, everybody laughed at the silly thing. Oh, so, Well, add John Williams' music and all that, and it wasn't so silly. Yeah. <laughs> but when we had had the first screening in L.A. area, we had all the executives there, Lou Wasserman, who was the head of the studio, and you know everybody that was involved. And so I was concerned as people involved with the shark that their people were going to laugh when they saw it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, when, when it comes up and Shatter says, we need a bigger boat. We thought, Oh, they're going to laugh. They didn't laugh. They screamed and they screamed and they, and, uh, so we had five huge screams. As I recall, the studio executives immediately, I think they went off into the men's room and they said, we got to rethink the release of this picture. So, <laughs> Instead of six or seven theaters, they released it, the biggest release in the summer ever, which was like 450 theaters, yep. and uh, which now they did thousands. But 450 was huge, and uh, by the into the first week, it already paid for what it cost, you know. Mm-hmm. I mean, it was going to cost four hundred and uh, four and a half million. I think it ended up seven and a half, so we are double the budget budget or whatever yeah but just not first weekend. it just surprised everybody wow you know uh well it didn't surprise us that it was good it just we were concerned about the reaction mm-hmm. of um but i have stories now let me tell you because this is a 40th anniversary yep and it doesn't stop i have i get Letters and uh, would you sign this? Would you draw a shark thing? Would you do blah blah blah? But but early in February, I before I got a call from Carl Gottlieb, who wrote uh, you know, the screenwriter. Yep. He said, "Joe, you won't believe this. I just came back from New York for a reading of a new play called Bruce, which is the name of the shark, about the making of Jaws." Oh. And I, they flew me up to Seattle. This is the first week of, uh, of February. Uh, and I was there for three days to watch uh, about 20 people reading this script uh, of this play. It's not it's Jaws, but it's the making of Jaws and the preparation. And you have all these characters. You have my character who sings and how I'm going to make it. And Stephen saying, oh, this is going to drive me crazy. And I... The third day, they had the whole read-through without uh, a break. And I thought, this is amazing. There's so many Jaws fans. They're going to love this because it really, the music quite good. Mm-hmm. And, um, and it's about this incredible, difficult project of making this shark with this very young director who was 28 years old. And, uh, you know, and actors saying... Uh, Dreyfus is saying, oh, I don't want to do it. I've got all these things. No, you don't. And we'll get Scheider. <laughs> Who's Scheider? Oh, did you see uh, French Connection? And then somebody says, oh, I don't like French movies. Oh, no, this guy is great. It's not, you know. And it was, uh, it blew me away, uh, I, I must say. So 
This is supposed to open in, uh, if the virus is all gone, in New Jersey uh, in, uh, I think, October of this year. Okay, that's amazing. We'll have to Pretty have interesting. For that. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah, really interesting. Sorry, I've been so quiet. I just, I love these stories. Yeah, <laughs> I know you kind of feel like in awe just to hear that there's so much going on in behind the scenes of uh, and, and stuff you don't know about or hope to hear about. So it's kind of nice to yeah. get a little sneak well, peek it, into something. <laughs> Yeah, it's it, it's just guys. It's, it's just sort of funny because I've been involved with movies for a long time, different movies, but this what movie doesn't go away. I mean, it's just constantly there. The people that are involved uh, about uh, Jaws stuff, you know. Yeah. Anyway. Yep. No, it's absolutely amazing. All right. Well, uh, Matty G, do you want to get into our second part of the show and start with our rapid fire questions for Joe? Absolutely, I do. Excellent. So for our listeners who are tuning in for the first time, uh, next uh, is section is our rapid-fire questions, where Matty G will ask Joe uh, 20 quick questions, and Joe just has to give us the first thing that comes to his mind. There's no right or wrong. It's just uh, some good old fun. Rapid-fire questions. Now, now, Joe, they're not super, super fast, so don't worry if you, you uh, want to take a minute okay, to think yeah. about it. <laughs> <laughs> so... All right, cool. Well, let's get to know you here, Joe. So uh, first question, what made-up word would you register into the English language? Oh, Kambaba. Okay, Uh, cool. What's the scariest dream that you can remember? I I can't remember a scary dream. Oh, that's good. You're having a good night's sleep then. Excellent. Uh, (laughs) Yeah. what, What superpower do you wish you had? I wish uh, I could be a better writer uh, because everything with me is visual. Okay, cool. Yeah. Very cool. Um, what's your earliest childhood memory? Uh, breaking my leg. Uh, I was born with a club foot. I always had a brace. And when they took the brace off, I was running and I, I fell off the stairs and I broke my leg. Oh, oh no. damn! That's Did you get ice cream though out of it? <laughs> yeah, my mother had to carry me to the doctor. I mean, it was down the street. I could remember that. And how stupid! After you know, I had this thing with my leg that I did a stupid thing, jumped off the stairs. Oh wow! <laughs> well, I'm, I'm so happy. Excited. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, what makes you the happiest? I think just my family. Uh, I've got two wonderful daughters and a great wife, and. Uh, I think uh, I started a family late in my life. Uh, didn't have kids until in my mid fifties, and uh, so uh, they're uh, in their twenties, and I'm in my eighties. But it's cool. Beautiful. Hey, great answer. Family is really important, especially in these times. Yeah. Um, if you could learn a foreign language, which one would you pick? Well, I would like to. I was born with my parents were immigrants from Portugal, mm. and uh, so I learned a, a little bit of Portuguese. I would like to have that language back. I went to Portugal, and uh, and I love Brazilian music, and that's all Portuguese. So I, w- I would like to, uh, yeah, Very have cool. that language back. Yeah, that's cool. I work with a few folks from uh, that are Portuguese, so. It's uh, it's interesting oh, really? hearing yeah. them talk. It's, it's a nice different language, language isn't it? It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's not. It's softer. Like okay, my mm-hmm. name is Alves. In, in in Spanish, it would be Alves. Yep. So uh, Spanish is sharper, and there's a lot more ooze and ages. And if you listen to the Brazilian music, you get a lot of that softness. You know. Yeah, yeah that's cool. Nice. Yeah. What uh, in your lifetime? What was your favorite decade to live in? Well, of course, now, but I have to say the 70s when I did Jaws 1, 2, and uh, Close Encounters, and, uh, uh, yeah, and I liked the music a lot. Uh, yeah. And so I, w- I would say, other than living now, I would say the 70s. Perfect. Very cool. Um, do and they were great for joke? movies, too. Yeah, Pardon? They were. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do you have a go-to joke? Not offhand, no. Okay. Oh, that's Sorry. cool. Some people yep. do, some people don't. Um, what was the first movie that ever made you cry? The first movie that made me cry? Oh, gosh, I have to really think hard on that. It would probably be Bambi. Okay, yep. yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, you remember when Bambi's mother dies? Yeah. Yep. Gosh. Yep. Yeah. Yep, totally. 